like sitting around till the last talk. I hope you've been uh, enjoying the talk so far. Um, and also, uh, thank you to Hootsuite for providing space and to Zach for coordinating setting this up. Um, this is, uh, I think, my third or fourth GoTo uh, meetup that I've attended, but the first one I'm speaking at, so I thought I'd start off with a quick introduction. Um, I, uh, my, the two projects I'm going to be speaking about today are open source projects, so um, a bit of relevant history is that uh, I, I started working on open source, or contributing more significantly to open source things, um, while I was working at Yelp around 2012. Uh, I was on the team that was responsible for uh, some of the Yelp's open source projects, and uh, we also contributed to uh, external projects. As part of that work, I started contributing to Docker Compose. Um, and so through that work and through some of the experience I gained there, and the, uh, I got more interested in Docker, and I joined Do Docker in 2016, started writing a lot more Go. Uh, and the two projects that I'm going to be speaking about were um, created out of problems that we encountered with the, uh, the test suites there at, at Docker, so created by myself and uh, a colleague of mine. Uh, more recently, I joined Circle CI, just over a year ago, uh, where I continue to write Go whenever I can. So, uh, the subject of my talk is uh, these two projects in the Go Test Yourself uh, GitHub org. Um, they are these two right here. There's uh, Go Test Tools, which is a collection of libraries, and Go Test Sum, which is a Go Test Runner. So, uh, I think I'll start out by talking about um, Go Test Tools, but before that, I want to mention uh, a couple of the constraints that we had while we while we were uh, addressing this problem. So uh, my colleague and I, we, we have been working with the test suite and we noticed that uh, both internal and external contributors uh, often had difficulties working with the test suite. Sometimes this is because of flaky tests, uh, but other times it was, uh, they, they would make a change and the test would fail and it would be very difficult to figure out why it was failing and, and what the problems were. Uh, so the, the constraints that we had were that uh, there was a very large number of tests, there were thousands of tests, and so rewriting and changing the nature of the test wasn't really an option. We had to stick with the general structure and make kind of more surgical changes. Um, and whatever uh, recommendations or policies that we attempted to come up with needed to be uh, easy to communicate and, and, and simple enough that you know we could have a lot of external contributors follow them. And, uh, we didn't have to take a lot of time in PR review to kind of explain the nuances of, of the, the techniques we were trying to uh, use. So, that said, uh, let's take a look at the first package and the first problem we encountered. Uh, a large number of the tests were use uh, exec.command to run some, some binary. Uh, sometimes this was to set up the environment, and sometimes it was for testing uh, the Docker CLI itself. So we we run the CLI as a, as, a, as a command, and we make assertions about um, behavior or the uh, One of the common problems here was that uh, the errors returned by command exec are not very informative. They're generally just exit status one. So we need some way of getting more information about what happened. Uh, so the solution that we came up with was is this package here. So uh, the I here in I command is because we generally use these from integration test suites, so it's the uh, integration test commands. Um, you'll see the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dive into the Go doc for a few of these, because hopefully we've put enough work into the Go docs that we can uh, easily understand the package from the Go doc. You can see it's fairly short. Without going over every single function, I thought I'd jump to some of the examples. Um, so this first example shows us, uh, we create a command with a helper, we run the command, it returns a result. Is that large enough? <laughs> yeah. A little, little bit bigger? Okay. Yeah, 250? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, let's see here. So yeah, we, we run a command, we get a result back, and then we uh, assert that the result matches some expectation. So in this case, our expectation is that it's going to have an exit code of 1, and the standard error is going to have uh, a, an error, something like this. Uh, and since this, this succeeds, so we don't get any kind of failure message. Taking a look at the second example, uh, in this case, we have a similar command, but we are expecting something different. 
uh, in this case, we're expecting success. Success is the empty expectation object, so it's got an exit status of zero, and we're not making any expectations about the standard out or standard error. And we can see that we get um, a fairly complete error message that can, it, it, it echoes all the things we passed in, so the command. Um, and it also tells us everything we need to know about the uh, output of that command. And at the bottom, it tells us all of the expectations that were not met. So uh, by using this package, we could ensure that everyone who was contributing new tests, or uh, we could convert all of the existing tests to the package, and we knew that we were always going to get consistent error message and complete error messages whenever we ran commands. And we also had a convenient way of testing standard and standard error all at once. The next problem we encountered was working with large multi-valued strings. This happens uh, quite a bit. CLI especially outputs um, you know, tables and of data. Uh, the, the problems that we encountered were that uh, we need some way of visualizing the difference between the expected and the actual value. Just printing them next to each other is, makes it pretty difficult to see the difference. Um, so we want some kind of unified diff, something like git diff. Um, and we also wanted a convenient way to update these values. If we had you know, 200 tests and we made a little bit of a change to a table where there was extra space, we don't want to have to go through and manually edit 200 files to, to update the expected values. So once again, jumping to the Go doc, we can see this golden package. Uh, it, it works with files stored in the test data directory which is a Go test convention. Um, and we can take a look at some of these examples once again. Um, or actually, before that, I'll mention that. So we have this, if you run Go test with this flag, test update golden, um, it will update all of the expected value files to the new actual value. And then if you run git diff, you can see the, the change in the, the expectation. So our first example is, again, a success case. We have an actual value. We give it a path to an expected uh, file that has the expected value stored. And we get no output because the test passes. In the second case, uh, we have a failing test. So in this case, our expected value is the same, but our actual value is different. And our failure message uh, contains a unified gift. So it hides all the things that are similar. It shows us the lines that are different and it makes it quite easy to, to notice the difference. Now, uh, you can see the URL bar here, but you might notice that I'm using localhost to view these docs instead of the uh, published docs. <clears throat> and the reason for this is because while I was adding these output examples, um, uh, if you're familiar with the go test examples, you can add example uh, test functions and you can set an expectation there as comments. Uh, go test was not liking my expected outputs that I've added here because there was a difference. But of course, if I looked at the difference, I could not see it because it was probably in white space. And even if I copied and pasted them or tried to diff them, I couldn't find it. So I haven't figured that out yet. But the golden package uh, solves this problem by looking at uh, the diff. And if the only difference in the diff is white space, it will replace all of the white space characters with a visual character. So there's no more searching through the diff trying to find you know, the extra new line or the extra white space. In this case, we can see there is a trailing white space, oh, along with some other differences in there. But it makes it uh, a little bit easier to, to detect those problems. So um, yeah, that, I think, solved the second problem we encountered. The third package is FS, which is short for file system. So again, a number of tests work with the file system in some form. Either they needed to create uh, large nested directories where, uh, with files with very specific uh, users, specific modes, specific timestamp, or it, the, the uh, function under test created these, and we need to make uh, assertions or we need to inspect the file system to see if it created these directories, these files perfectly. So once again, jumping to the Go doc for this package, um, you can see it's a little bit longer. Uh, maybe we'll start with the new directory example. Uh, so in this case, we are creating a new directory. We're going to give it a prefix for the random name that it's going to generate. And in this case, we are creating that directory with a single file. The file name is file one and some content. 
And once we create that directory uh, struct, we'll defer the removal of it, and we can use path to get the name. We can see here that this, this FX with file, this is a path up. This is a, the pattern is called functional options, I believe, and there's a large number of path ups that you can use for it to set um, any properties of a file or a directory you might want or create nested directories or files within directories. However, you can also use these path operations to make uh, to build up a manifest that uh, allows you to inspect the, the structure of a directory. So in this case, we've got an operation which creates some files, and then we build up a fairly complicated expectation. We expect the root directory to have a mode of 0700. Uh, we expect there to be a file called one with some bytes that we pull from, a, from another file. Uh, we expect that file to have a mode of 0600. Uh, we also expect another directory to be there with a config file. In this case, we don't care about what bytes are in that file. We just want to make sure it exists. And so if we run that through a cert, we see that uh, we get this hopefully helpful um, failure message telling us all about uh, what did not match our expectations. Uh, the mode of the root directory was different. Um, one file didn't exist, but there was an extra file called extra that we didn't expect, and a similar case in the data directory. So I think that uh, made it quite a bit easier to work with uh, tests whenever they had uh, they were they either created very large uh, complex directories or they required them to exist. Uh, yeah. Before going on to the next package, I just want to call out maybe the, the elephant in the room that uh, assertions seem to be, for better or worse, a uh, somewhat controversial topic <coughs> in the Go community. Um, I understand that, I'm aware that, I'm not going to try to change anyone's opinion, uh, but I do think that done correctly, they can be valuable. I found them to be valuable. So that's, that's all I'll say about it. And of course, the next package is a uh, more general assertion package. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, the problem we encountered was that we were actually using two different assertion libraries. We were using both Testify and GoCheck in different test suites, and neither one of them was really uh, providing the values that we hoped they would provide. Um, I won't get into all of the details of the problems, but um, the solution that we came up with was, of course, to create a third package. <laughs> <laughs> so this package was... Uh, heavily inspired by the PyDefS test, uh, test framework. It was much, much smaller and a lot more opinionated. Uh, because it was created more recently, it uh, was able to take advantage of the t.helper feature added in Go 1.9, which meant that instead of uh, spending a lot of time worrying about um, getting the file name and the line number of the, of the test failure, we could just use the existing support in Go test, and we could focus a lot more on the comparisons and failure messages. And as much as possible, we tried to make sure that we were not uh, hiding any of the nice features of Go. You know, we wanted to work well with table tests, we wanted to complement testing, we didn't want to create a whole new framework that you had to learn. We wanted to try to, as much as possible, avoid the pitfalls that the Go authors had called out in the Go FAQ. So, taking a quick look at that, I won't get into too much of this, but this is kind of a high level we can see that there are very few assertions and that over half of them are really just about dealing with error cases. Um, the one thing I will call out is that equals, uh, unlike other frameworks, really means the same thing it means in Go. It is the equals equals operator. Um, and that is to attempt to kind of keep with common terminology um, that already exists in Go. And, uh, this equals operation has the um, white space unified diff features that are built into the, uh, to the goal of testing as well. So if you have multi-line string and you don't want to store it in a file, you can still take advantage of uh, the rich uh, failure messages here. And of course, that means you still need a way of comparing uh, nested structures or maps or slices. Um, instead of using reflect.dp tools, which uh, can be difficult to visualize the failures. You're kind of left um, trying to print a representation of the two in a unified GIF, and you have a bunch of pointers that look like this, but are actually not part of your GIF. Um, this DB equals uses the uh, Google Go uh, Compare Go Comp library, which uh, 
has quite a large number of nice features. It lets you ignore specific types in the comparison, ignore specific fields, uh, convert one type to another, set custom comparisons for different types. Uh, and it makes it much, much easier to compare large, uh, heavily nested structures. So that is the very quick overview of the assert package. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, we had a problem that now we had three frameworks and we wanted fewer frameworks. So I wrote this tool called uh, Migrate from Testify. And what this does is that it reads the AST and it rewrites the code from the testify assertions to the new Go test tools assertions. So taking a, well, I won't go into Go too much, but I just want to highlight that Go does provide quite a, num a large number of packages that make this relatively easy to do. Um, one of the fun challenges of this tool, uh, of writing this tool, was that uh, testify has just uh, one equals that does the equals for everything, whereas Go test tools, as we saw, has two different equals. Uh, so not only does it have to inspect the AST, it also has to figure out the types of the values passed to the equals. And if it's a, it's a primitive it's a scale like string or int, then it can use equals. But if it's a, either an unrecognized type or a map or a struct, then it will convert it to deep equals. So it wasn't so much just converting the AST, it actually had to dig in deeper and actually kind of understand something about the test suite. I had a lot of fun writing this. It's possibly the, the most interesting part of the whole thing. Um, all right, so that is the quick overview of some of the packages and test tools. There's a few more there, but I think that's kind of a bulk of it to give you a sense of, of what's there. The last thing I wanted to mention was Go Test Sum. So uh, this is a Go Test runner. It takes advantage of the dot j, uh, dash JSON flag that was eight, uh, added in Go one, uh, 110. If you're not familiar with that, effectively what that does is instead of printing out the human readable Go test output that we're all probably fairly familiar with, it prints out a JSON line equivalent of, of that data. And what Go test sum does is ingest that data. It uh, prints it out in either one of the existing formats you might be familiar with, Go test uh, the non verbose version or Go test uh, dash db. And there's a few other formats that you can also select from that are new formats introduced by GoTest, some that are a little bit more compact and have color and things like that. Once it's printed out, the regular test output includes a summary at the end of skip test, fail test, and, uh, and counts. And it also makes it uh, easier to integrate with CI systems. So the way that's usually done is through a uh, JUnit XML. In addition to printing it to standard, air, uh, standard out, it writes a file with that JU uh, XML. So let's take a quick look at that. First, there is this demo in the repo that should run in a second. There we go. That's one of the formats, just dots. And uh, we can see here there's a summary of all the skip tests, the reason they're skipped, and a summary line. This is the short format. We see check marks for success. There'd be a red S for a failure. And uh, yeah, let's look at this in another view. So here we go. Here we're on uh, circle CI. We have the Docker CLI test suite. We can see here that Circle CI that Circle CI understands a little bit about our test suite. We can see that they can understand the number of tests and how many failures there were, and this is through that JUnit XML output. And here's our test output. We've got one line per package, the elapsed time per package, and again at the very end, the reason that any tests were skipped. Um, same idea here. If there were any failures or package uh, build failures, you know, some what the didn't get into in too much detail, but one of the problems we hit with the Docker test suite is very large. So our options were either the non-verbose mode, which hit a lot of things, or the verbose mode, which made it very, very difficult to find build package failures, which you couldn't necessarily just grab for. So the idea here is to summarize all those things at the end to make it very easy to find the things you probably care about when your tests fail. And I think that was my very quick overview of the tools, some of the testing tools that I worked on. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. Happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, there is a package called Diffwim, which is uh, used by Testify as well. Um, 
It had not been updated in two to three years, so I ended up just uh, stripping out a lot of the stuff I didn't use and, and tendering it into the library itself. It just have one less dependency. But yeah, it is, it's a different that I believe was modeled or like ported from I think Python's version of Diffle or something like that. Cool. Um, so maybe I'm going to move on this one. Um, what's the issue with the uh, certs? <laughs> um, they're, they're controversial, so let me jump back to this slide here. So the, the official Golang FAQ has a section about it from the Go authors that talks about like, uh, you know, error handling. Uh, oh, is this Go specific? Yes, this is Go specific. Oh, okay. Yes, it's a, it's a Go community thing. That's like, a, a, the, some of their points are like, um, you, you need to be very careful about error handling. You want to make sure error handling is very explicit. You don't want to just kind of gloss over error handling. So testing is kind of like that. Um, you don't want like a mini framework that hides, like you already know Go, you don't want to have to learn some other thing. Um, they suggest maybe tests might work better table-driven, like yeah, table-driven tests are awesome. I don't know if that necessarily means assertions are unnecessary. Uh, the stats here can show that, you know, uh, within the Go community, there are more people not writing tests than use all of the other test frameworks to find, which is a, a, little bit, a little bit scary. Maybe hopefully this, there weren't a lot of people reporting on this survey and, and this data is incorrect. Um, I'm sure there are people here that can, that can argue both sides of it. I, I, can, I can certainly argue one side of it, but um, yeah, it's, it's a controversial project. But so was package management just a year ago, and that changed. So maybe maybe things will change. I don't know. But also with the assertion, ever since they introduced t.helper, that made those kinds of packages much better. Because before that, if you use one of those packages and they didn't use t.helper, good luck trying to find that error. There's no way you're going to find it in a big test. Yeah. And I do think that there's certainly like there's there's certainly a way to do assertions wrong. I still think there's a way to do them right. I don't know if my way is right. I like it, but it's it's, it's another experiment. It's another data point. Maybe maybe we'll arrive on something that the Go community is having your way. One thing you you shown uh, the CLI that uh, all kind of exact comparison of the uh, uh, standard out and standard error. Yeah. This is to my taste a bit terrible. I mean, somebody can change one character and say that, and we're going to make who knows how many tests, and especially if you're using stuff which is not created by you, but you use some other important. Right. What about like trying to do it using regex or something a bit less sensitive to fluctuations like this? Yeah, yeah. So I think that, that gets into testing philosophy. So I've got a colleague down at Circle CI, and we got into a little bit about, like, okay, you've got this large string, you know, should you be very. Uh, specific about it, or should you just um, try to assert different properties? I, I'm still in the camp of be precise because I think that as long as it's predictable um, it, and easy to update, that you get value in knowing that there has been a change. Whereas if you're just looking at properties, it's it, it's hard to be like uh, it's hard to know all the properties that you care about up front and. Changes can sneak in without you knowing about. So my my personal opinion is that be strict about it. To your point, though, there are some times where you can't predict all the values, right? If you're dealing with with timestamps, either you have to lock out a bunch of stuff, or it's going to be different. So there are certainly cases where it doesn't work. Um, one of the cases we ran into, uh, I don't know if I can, I probably be able to pull it up quickly enough, but uh, Docker build output, you know, the IDs that it generates are different. So uh, I had a, a solution for that, which was um, you effectively build up. Uh, you, you you inspect it line by line. You say, okay, line zero should match this pattern. So some lines you can you can say exactly this, and some lines are like match this pattern. So you can kind of like sometimes break down the output and make uh, not necessarily a regex, but sometimes it was like contains this or like starts with ends with. Uh, yeah, certainly not going to handle every case. I, I I don't think the the intent is not to handle every case. It's kind of just to handle the the percent case. If you've got a lot of times where you can predict the output, then yeah. Other questions? <laughs> Thank you.